For the past couple of nights, we've been going over the sets of the Wings to Awakening. We've done three sets so far. The four establishings of mindfulness, the four right exertions, the four bases for power. Those are sets that deal with effort, mindfulness, concentration. The next two sets, which are basically identical, the five faculties and the five strengths, contain effort, mindfulness, concentration, and they add two more, conviction and discernment. These provide the framework for our practice. It's because of conviction that we're practicing, and it's for the sake of discernment that we're practicing concentration. And the two qualities help each other along. In a general sense, conviction in the fact that there is a path to awakening. It's like being convinced that there's a way to get out of the forest when you're lost in the forest. When you're convinced that there's a way out, you're more likely to find it. Discernment is what's going to find the way out. So the discernment comes from the fact that you're convinced. If you don't have that conviction, discernment doesn't have the energy it needs to figure out what that way is, or to even see that it's worthwhile to try. In a more specific sense, conviction focuses on our conviction that the Buddha was awakened. He really did, through his own efforts, find an end to suffering, and his awakening included three knowledges, knowledge of past lives, knowledge of how beings are reborn through their, through their karma, and then finally the liberation of the mind through the Four Noble Truths. And based on that, we see the Dharma is well taught. Those who have followed the Dharma have found awakening as well. That's part of our conviction, too, which gives us the energy to say, well, if they can do it, we can do it. And finally, there are virtues that are pleasing to the Noble Ones, pleasing both in the sense that they are fully followed, and also pleasing in the sense that you don't exalt yourself and disparage others over the fact that you follow the precepts and they don't. This virtue, as the Buddha says in other places, is what underlies our practice of the right exertions, practice of right mindfulness. The practice of concentration and the basis for power, but also gives focus to our discernment. On the one hand, we focus on our actions, because as the Buddha said, that's what's going to make all the difference. And where our actions come from, they come from the mind. So we realize we've got to train the mind, and training the mind will require seeing things in terms of the Four Noble Truths. Now, those Four Noble Truths are not intuitive. The Buddha says we suffer because of our clinging, and our knee-jerk reaction usually is we're suffering because of things other people have done or situations outside. Or we may say that we're suffering because we're bad people in, our, in ourselves. Our nature is inherently bad, so we deserve to suffer. Those kinds of things the Buddha says put aside. We suffer because of an activity we do, and it's an activity that we can learn how not to do, regardless of how long we've been doing it. And so we're willing to give the Four Noble Truths a serious try, because the Buddha says they were the truths that got him out of, out of suffering. So this conviction is what it impels us to want to look at where are we clinging, where are we craving, what qualities of mind can we develop so that we can get past that craving and put an end to the clinging. So conviction motivates us to practice and to develop the discernment in terms of the Four Noble Truths. And then it's our, our discernment that turns around and verifies our conviction. It's when, in applying the duties of the Four Noble Truths, that we finally have an experience of the deathless. 
that we realized that our conviction was well-founded. The Buddha really did know what he was talking about. Anyone who's followed the path will have attained the same results. So this confirms our conviction in the Buddha and the Dhamma and the Sangha. But it does it in an interesting way. There's a passage where the Buddha says that at stream entry, you have seen the five faculties in terms of their origination, their passing away, their allure, their drawbacks, and the escape from them. Now that fivefold analysis is something the Buddha usually reserves for dealing with unskillful things, or objects of attachment, objects of clinging. But here he's applying it to the path. And it's interesting that the commentary, which tends to like to explain everything down to the last little word in the suttas, doesn't explain anything in that particular passage at all. But what it's getting at is the fact that even the path is fabricated and you have to go beyond it. As the Buddha says elsewhere, the five faculties originate in heedfulness. You realize that it is possible, or someone has suggested the possibility, that our actions can make a difference between whether we're happy or not happy. And we realize that the heedful path is to assume that, yes, our actions do make a difference, because otherwise your actions just get thrown away. You have choices and you don't see them as important, you're going to get careless. You realize that. You realize that it's in your best interest to adopt the principle of conviction. And then based on the conviction, the heedful path is to work on developing skillful qualities in the mind and abandoning unskillful ones, to develop mindfulness, to develop concentration, to develop discernment. Heedfulness underlies all of these things. It provides the connection between the different faculties. So that's the origination of the five faculties. The passing away is when heedfulness lapses. Their allure, of course, is the happiness that comes from them, particularly the happiness that comes from concentration. But there's a happiness that comes from being convinced of things that suggest that you are a noble human being, you can become a noble human being. And as you see that nobility developing through your right efforts, you see that you're developing a, a fund of knowledge that you can apply to develop skillful qualities. You can remember those things that you've learned from the past. And your discernment allows you to let go of things that have been weighing down the mind. This is all going to be part of the allure of the faculties as you're practicing them. Of course, the drawbacks of the faculties are that they're fabricated. They have to be maintained. And so when you see the limitations of them, that's when you're really ready to go beyond them. But you're not going to see the limitations until you've mastered them and to see how far they can take you. But it's when they lead to that escape, when you escape from conviction and you escape from per persistence, from mindfulness, from concentration, from discernment through that dispassion. That's when we realize, okay, these qualities really do lead to the deathless. And you have no more need for conviction, but your conviction has been confirmed. This is why we practice these, these faculties. They are means. And the Buddha is very clear about the fact that they are means. But they show their true value, partly as we practice, because they do have that allure as you're practicing. But they show their ultimate value when you go even beyond the allure, you go to the escape. And the Buddha illustrates this with the image of a, an elephant hunter looking for a bull elephant in the forest. He sees large footprints, 
but he doesn't come to the immediate conclusion that, that they must be the footprints of a bull elephant because there are dwarf females with large feet. But they look promising. And the heedful path is to follow what looks promising. He follows them and he sees scratch marks up in the trees. Again, he doesn't jump to the conclusion that these must be the scratch marks left by a big bull elephant because there are tall females with tusks. But again, it looks promising. And the heedful approach it when it's something that looks promising is you follow it through. He finally gets to the clearing where the big bull elephant is standing, and that's when he knows, okay, this is the elephant I've been looking for. Now, in that analogy, the, f the five faculties are the footprints. And the heedful thing to do is to follow them. They will be confirmed when you gain the escape from them. Because that's when they show how truly helpful they are. There was one point where the Buddha asked Sariputta, who at that point had become an arahant, do you believe that the five faculties lead to the deathless? And he said, no. I don't. Sariputta said, no, I don't believe. I know. There's that knowledge that we want to get to. But in the meantime, the heedful path is to develop these faculties as best we can.